man, my dear, a single man with four or five thousand a year. What a fine thing for our girls. How so? How can it affect them? Uh, Mr. Bennett, how can you be so tiresome? You must know that I'm thinking of his marrying one of them. Oh, is that his design in coming here? Design? Nonsense. How can you talk so? But it is very likely that he may fall in love with one of them, and therefore you must visit him as soon as he comes. Oh, I see no occasion for that. But, but my dear, you must. <laughs> Only think what a match it will be for one of the girls. Indeed, you must go, for it will be impossible for us to visit him if you do not. <laughs> you are over-scrupulous, surely. I will write to Mr Bingley and assure him of my hearty consent to his marrying whichever he chooses of the girls. Though I must throw in a good word for my little I desire you will do no such thing. My Lizzie is not half so handsome as Jane, nor half so good-humoured as Lydia, but you're always giving her the preference. Oh, well, they have, they have none of them much to recommend them. They are all silly and ignorant like other people. Mr Bennet, how can you abuse your own children in such a way? You delight in vexing me. You, you have no compassion for my poor nerves. You mistake me, my dear. I have a great respect for your nerves. They are my old <coughs> friends. I have heard you mention them with consideration these 20 years at least. <coughs> now then, girls, how are you all this fine morning? Very well, Father. I am delighted to hear it, Jane. That is a nice hat, Lizzie. I hope Mr <coughs> Bingley will like it. We are not in a way to know what Mr Bingley will like, since you will not visit him. <coughs> but you forget, Mama. We shall meet him at the next ball. <coughs> oh, do we stop coughing so, Mary, for heaven's sake. Have a little compassion for my poor nerves. You tear them to pieces. Mary has no discretion in her coughs. She times them ill. I do not cough for my own amusement. <laughs> when is your next ball to be, Kitty? In three days' time, the assembly room in Merritt. Aye, so it is, which gives us no time at all to become acquainted with Mr Bingley. It certainly is a short time. One cannot get to know what a man really is in just a few days. What say you, Mary? For you are a young lady of deep reflection, I know, and read many books. Well... While Mary is adjusting her ideas, let us return to Mr Bingley. Oh, I am sick of Mr Bingley. I am sorry to hear that. Had I known as much this morning, I certainly would not have gone to call upon him. It is very unlucky, but as I have actually paid the visit, we cannot escape the acquaintance now. Oh, my dear Mr. Bennett, how good of you. I thought a good joke, too, that you should have gone this morning and not said a word about it until now. Now, Mary, I believe you may cough as much as you choose. What an excellent father you have, girls. I do not know how you will ever thank him for his kindness. Now, we must have you all looking well for this ball. Lydia, my love, though you are the youngest, I am sure Mr Bingley will dance with you. Oh, I am not afraid of that, for though I am the youngest, I am the best dancer. <laughs> hey, I am glad to be home, Lizzie. I could not help but feel badly about how much trouble I must have caused Mr Bingley and Caroline by my illness. I believe Mr Bingley would gladly have had twice as much trouble if it had meant you staying under his roof for a longer time. You should rather feel sorry for the trouble you caused me, being forced to spend so many evenings with Mr. Darcy and Miss Bingley. <laughs> not even your Mr. Bingley's company could compensate me for that. He is not my Mr. Bingley, is he? Not yet. I hope, my dear, that you have ordered a good dinner today, for I have every reason to expect an addition to our family party. What do you mean, my dear? Oh, I know, Mr. Bingley, I am sure. Oh, but how unlucky. There's not a bit of fish to be had today. I must speak to Hill this minute. It is not Mr. Bingley. It is a person who I never saw before in the whole course of my life. <laughs> about a month ago, I received this letter. About a fortnight ago, I answered it, for I believe it needed early attention. It is from my cousin, uh, Mr. Collins, who, when I am dead, may turn you all out of this house as soon as he pleases. <laughs> My dear, I cannot bear to hear that odious man mentioned. I do think it is the hardest thing in the world that your estate be entailed away from your own children just because they are not male. It certainly is a most iniquitous affair, and nothing can clear Mr Collins from the guilt of inheriting Longbourn. But if you will listen to his letter, I think you may be a little softened by his manner of expressing himself. No, that I am sure I shall not.
Dear Sir, Having had the misfortune to lose my late honoured father, I have frequently wished to heal the breach between our two families. Having received ordination, I have been so fortunate as to be distinguished by the patronage of the Right Honourable Lady Catherine de Bourg, whose bounty and beneficence have preferred me to a valuable living at the rectory on her estate. As a clergyman, I feel it is my duty to promote and establish the blessing of peace in all families within my influence, and I trust that you will not reject the offered olive branch. Moreover, I cannot be otherwise than deeply concerned at my being the means of injuring your most amiable daughters, and I can assure you of my readiness to make them every possible amends. If you have no objection to receiving me, I propose myself the satisfaction of waiting on you and your family on Monday by four o'clock, and shall likely trespass upon your hospitality until the Saturday following. And I mean, dear sir, your well-wisher and friend, William Collins. We may therefore expect this peacemaking gentleman imminently. He seems a conscientious sort of man, and I doubt not will prove a valuable acquaintance. Well, he is prepared to make the girls any amends. I, for one, shall not be the person to disagree with him. Although it is difficult to guess in what way he can make the amends he thinks are due. The wish is certainly to his credit. There is something very pompous in his style. Can you be a sensible man, sir? No, my dear, I think not. Indeed, I have great hopes of finding him quite the reverse. It is a pity our cousin will not be regimental. I think a man is nothing without regimentals. Who wants to be visited by a dull clergyman? Mr. Collins, may I present Mrs. Bennett and my daughters? Would you like to come and join us? Certainly. Oh, thank you very much. Oh. Mrs. Bennett, dear sir, I must compliment you on having so fine a family of daughters. I have heard much of their beauty, but in this instance, fame has fallen short of the truth. I have no doubt of your seeing them all disposed of in marriage in due course. You are very kind, sir, I am sure, and I wish with all my heart it may prove so, or else it will be destitute, things are settled so oddly. Ahem. Uh you allude, I take it, to the entail of this estate. Aye, sir, I do indeed. It is a grievous affair for my poor girls, you must confess. Not that I mean to find fault with you, for... I know such things are all chance in this world. I am aware of the hardship to my fair cousins, and I can assure the young ladies that I come prepared to admire them. Uh, perhaps it you would be... uh, seem very fortunate in your patroness. Oh, yes, indeed, sir, indeed. My patroness, young ladies, is Lady Catherine de Bourg, and a more attentive and considerate patroness I could not have found. I have never in all my life witnessed such affability and condescension. Does she live near you, sir? The garden in which stands my humble abode is separated only by a lane from Rosings Park, her ladyship's residence. I think you said she was a widow, sir. Has she any family? She has one daughter, the heiress of Rosings, and a very extensive property. Ah, uh, then she is better off than many girls. And what sort of young lady is she? Is she handsome? Has she been presented at court? Her poor health unhappily prevents her from being in town. And by that, as I told Lady Catherine myself one day, she has deprived the British court of its brightest ornament. <laughs> you may imagine, sir, but I am always happy to offer those little delicate compliments which are always acceptable to ladies. It, it is happy for you that you possess the talent of flattering with delicacy. Uh, may I ask if these attentions proceed from the impulse of the moment, or, or are they the result of previous study? Well, they arise chiefly from what is passing at the time. And though I sometimes like to amuse myself by composing such elegant compliments as may be adapted to ordinary occasions, I always wish to give them as unstudied an air as possible. I shall walk to Meryton tomorrow to ask when Denny comes back from town. Lydia, Lydia, Mr. Collins is talking. Indeed, there is no offence. I bear my cousin no ill will. Mr. Bennet, 
I would be honored to be your antagonist in a game of backgammon. A game? Backgammon. She does help him on, <laughs> as much as her nature will allow. If I can perceive her regard for him, he must be a simpleton indeed not to discover it too. Remember, he does not know Jane's disposition as well as you do. It is, there will always be times when he will know that he might like her, and it is important that she should make the most of every half hour in which she can command his attention. <laughs> Your plan is a good one, where nothing is intended but the desire of being well married. Well, so I those are not Jane's feelings. She is not acting by design. I wish her every success. Probably some marriage is entirely a matter of chance, you know. Well, there will always be vexations and grief. It is better to know as little as possible in advance of the defects of the person with whom you are to part your life. You know that at that argument is not sound. You would never act in that way yourself. Miss Bennett, my friend Wickham asked me to convey his apologies to you in particular. He's been obliged to go to town on business. However, I doubt very much that his business would have called him away just now if he had not wished to avoid a certain gentleman here. Denny, you promised to dance with me. Do come along. <laughs> there, Charlotte, you see? It is as I told you. Mr. Darcy has greatly wronged Mr. Wickham, and now he has been forced to stay away from Netherfield because of him. Are you so sure that Mr. Wickham's word is to be trusted? How could it not be? He gave me all the details without reservation. And for myself, I know that Mr. Darcy is unforgiving, resentful, proud. I wondered if you would do me the honour of dancing the next with me. Why, I, I do not. I have not. Thank you. Yes. Oh, why could I not think of an excuse? Hateful man, I swore I would never dance with him. I dare say you will find him very agreeable. Heaven forbid. That is the greatest misfortune of all, to find a man agreeable whom one is determined to hate. Lizzie, do not be a simpleton. Do not allow your fancy for Wickham make you seem unpleasant in the eyes of a man ten times his consequence. number of couples to be standing up, but sometimes smaller groups allow for more graceful dancing. I believe it is sometimes pleasant to fall. Yes. It is your turn to say something now, Mr. Darcy. I talked about the dance. You ought to make some sort of remark about the size of the room, or the music, perhaps. I'm happy to say whatever you wish. Very well. Well, that reply will do for the present. Perhaps by and by I may observe that private balls are much pleasanter than public ones. Do you 
you talk by rule then, when you are dancing? Sometimes. One ought to speak a little, you know. And yet, for the advantage of some, conversation ought to be arranged, so that they may have the trouble of saying as little as possible. Consulting your own feelings in the present case. You seek to gratify mine. Both, I imagine. We are each of an unsocial, taciturn disposition, unwilling to speak unless we expect to say something that will amaze the whole room. It's no very striking resemblance of your own character, I am sure. And your sisters often walk to marriage. Yes, quite often. When you saw us there the other day, we had just been forming a new acquaintance. Mr. Wickham is blessed with such happy manners as may ensure his making friends easily. Whether he is equally capable of keeping them is less certain. He has been so unlucky as to lose your friendship, and in a manner which he is likely to suffer from all his life. I remember hearing you say once, Mr. Darcy, that you hardly ever forgave, that your resentment once created was unappeasable. You are very careful, I suppose, as to its being created. I am. And never allow yourself to be blinded by prejudice. I hope not. May I ask as to what these questions tend, Miss Bennett? Merely as to the illustration of your character. I'm trying to make it out. What is your success? I do not get on at all. I hear such different accounts of you as to puzzle me exceedingly. I would ask Miss Bennet that you would not attempt to sketch my character at the present moment. There is reason to fear the performance would do no credit on either party. If I do not take your likeness now, I may never have another opportunity. I by no means suspend any pleasure of yours. I hear you are quite delighted with George Wickham, but I find the young man quite forgot to tell you that he is merely the son of old Wickham, the late Mr. Darcy's steward. Let me advise you as a friend not to believe all his assertions. Wickham has treated Mr. Darcy in the most infamous manner. I pity you, Miss Eliza, for the discovery of your favourite's guilt, but really, considering his descent, one could not expect much better. His guilt and his descent appear by your account to be the same. For I have heard you accuse him of nothing worse than being the son of Mr. Darcy's steward, and I can assure you he informed me of that himself. I beg your pardon. Excuse my interference. It was kindly meant. Jane, I want to know what you've learned of Mr. Wickham. Or perhaps you have been too pleasantly engaged to think of any third person. No, indeed, I have not forgotten. But I have nothing satisfactory to tell you. Mr. Bingley does not know the circumstances. But he will vouch for the honour of his friend. He says that he fears that Mr. Wickham is by no means a respectable young man. Does Mr. Bingley know Mr. Wickham himself? No. He had not met him until the other morning at Thurrican. This account, then, is one he has learned from Mr. Darcy. I am satisfied. I do not doubt Mr. Bingley's sincerity, but you must excuse my not being convinced. I shall venture to think of both gentlemen as I did before. Just before we go into supper, some music would be delightful. Caroline, yes. could you do us to the... Ah, Miss Mary Bennett. How very good of you. I have just heard that there is now in the room a near relation of my patroness. I happen to overhear the gentleman himself, Mr. Darcy, mentioned his cousin, Mr. Bourg, and his aunt, Lady Catherine. As you know, Mr. Darcy and Mr. Bourg are intended to marry to unite the two family fortunes. I am so thankful that this discovery is made in time for me to pay my respects to him, which I am now going to do, and I trust he will excuse my not having done so before. You are not going to introduce yourself to Mr. Darcy? Oh, indeed I am. It will be in my power to assure him that her ladyship was quite well not one week ago. Of course, we expect an announcement any day now. 
Mr Bingley is such a charming young man and, and so taken with Jane. And what a fine thing this will be for her sister, since naturally it will throw them in the way of other rich men. <laughs> oh, my dear friend, I do hope that you might soon also know the satisfaction of seeing a daughter well married. It is such a comfort. <laughs> oh, Lydia! <laughs> <laughs> Miss Bennett! Goodness you gracious, Miss Bennett, come, come here! Sure, sorry, come on. Come on. Lydia, listen! <laughs> That will do extremely well, child. You have delighted us long enough. Let the other young ladies have time to exhibit. I believe supper is ready next door. Do you let us go through? If I was so fortunate as to be able to sing, I should be delighted, I'm sure, in obliging the company with an air, for I believe music to be a very innocent diversion and perfectly compatible with the profession of a clergyman. I do not mean, however, that we can be justified in devoting too much of our time to music, <laughs> for certainly the rector of a... Oh. Miss Bennett. I apologise for the intrusion. I had understood that Mrs Collins was here. <coughs> she has gone into town on business. Do sit down. I should leave. I had only meant to give my aunt's greetings to Mrs. Collins while I was passing. Please, would you be so kind as to convey these? Good day, Miss Bennett. Will not do. My feelings will not be repressed. You must allow me to tell you how ardently I admire and love you. Declaring myself thus, I am fully aware that I am going against the wishes of my family, my friends, and indeed my own better judgment. The relative situation of our families is such that any marriage between us must be regarded as highly reprehensible. Indeed, I regard it as such myself, but it cannot be helped. I have come to feel for you a passion, admiration, and regard. She's overcome every rational objection, and I beg you to relieve my suffering and to consent to be my wife. In such cases as these, it is, I believe, the established mode to express a sense of obligation. I cannot. I have never desired your good opinion, and you have certainly bestowed it most unwillingly. I am sorry to have occasion to pain to anyone. It was most unconsciously done, however, and I hope will be of short duration. Is this all the reply I have to have the odd honour of expecting? I might wish to be informed why, with so little endeavour at civility, I am thus rejected. And I might as well inquire why, with so evident a desire of offending and insulting me. You chose to tell me that you liked me against your will, against your reason, and even against your character. Was not this an excuse for incivility if I was uncivil? But I have other reasons. You know I have. Do you really think that any consideration could tempt me to accept the man who has been the means of ruining, perhaps forever, the happiness of a most beloved sister? Can you deny that you've done it, that you parted them? I have no wish to deny that I did everything in my power to separate my friend from your sister, or that I rejoice in my success towards him. I have been kinder than towards myself. And it is not merely this on which my dislike is founded. My opinion of you was decided when I first heard Mr. Wickham's account of your dealings with him. On this subject, what can you have to say? You take an eager interest in this gentleman's concern. Who that knows what his misfortunes have been can help feeling an interest in him. His misfortunes, yes, his misfortunes have been great indeed. And of your infliction. You have reduced him to his present state of poverty, and yet you treat the mention of his misfortune with contempt and ridicule. This is your opinion of him. My faults, according to this calculation, are heavy indeed. 
Perhaps his offences might have been overlooked had not your pride been hurt by my honest confession of the scruples that had at first prevented me forming any serious design on it. A disguise of every sort is my abhorrence. Could you expect me to rejoice in the inferiority of your connections? To congratulate myself on the hope of relations whose condition in life is so decidedly beneath my own? You are mistaken, Mr. Darcy. The mode of your declaration merely spared me the concern which I might have felt in refusing you had you behaved in a more gentlemanlike manner. You could not have made the offer of your hand in any possible way that would have tempted me to accept it. From the very beginning of our acquaintance, your manners impressed me with the fullest belief of your arrogance, your conceit, and your selfish disdain for the feelings of others. I had not known you a month before I knew that you were the last man in the world whom I could ever marry. You said quite enough, madam. I perfectly comprehend your feelings. But now I need to be ashamed of what my own have been. Forgive me for having taken up so much of your time. And accept my best wishes for your health and happiness.